So welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, and welcome to everyone online as well. Um, so we're here to talk about ChatGPT and hopefully get to the bottom of whether it's the, the next big thing or a passing trend and chuck a microphone around <laughs> here or there. While um, so very lucky to have two brilliant guests with me here tonight, um, Gina and Alex. So I'll just introduce them for, to start off with. Um, before I do, I should say I'm uh, Dr. Alfred Tiley. I'm a data scientist at the Data Lab here. Um, my background is in astrophysics, and I've worked in uh, public health and public transport. Uh, and the projects that I'm working on at the moment are to, mainly to do with um, using AI in, in health. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce Gina now. Uh, Dr. Gina Helfrich uh, is the Bailey Gifford Program Manager uh, at the Center for Technomoral Futures at the Edinburgh Futures Institute here at the University uh, of Edinburgh. She is Deputy Chair of the University's AI and Data Ethics Advisory Board and holds a PhD in philosophy from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, with a research focus in ethics and social philosophy. Prior to joining the center, Gina spent eight years working in nonprofit global technology and data science. So welcome, Gina. Uh, we also have Alex Velenov here, who's the chief technical officer of TAG Digital, which is an agency that specializes in event PPC. Alex has over 15 years of experience in digital marketing and project management, uh, working with agencies, in-house teams, and publishers. He's a futurist with a curious mind, interested in innovations, new tech, data, marketing, leadership, music, artificial intelligence, sound engineering, art, and everything in between. So welcome, Alex. Um, so to, to kick things off, um, we'll start by getting a gauge of uh, what people think about ChatGPT. And that, I'm, I'm talking about the, the three of us, but also our, we'll be asking uh, the audience as well what, uh, what your opinions are as well. So uh, Gina and Alex, I'll, we'll start off by just, uh, if you could just say uh, a, a few words about um, what you're working on at the moment, your current interests, and also your personal experience and intersections with ChatGPT, in a few sentences, what you think of, of the, uh, the technology. So Gina, if we start with you. Sure. Um, so thank you. I'm really pleased to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the program manager at the Center for Technomoral Futures here at the university. And in that respect, um, I work in an environment that's trying to unite several kinds of expertise when we're thinking about how we're going to go into the future with technologies like AI, not just technical technical expertise, but also uh, ethical expertise, political, social expertise. So the center is trying to bring together researchers, members of the community, government, all you know, all folks who are going to be touched by these technologies to have their say, have their input on what the future should look like. So that's really my role is to help with facilitating those conversations. Brilliant. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and you know, as you mentioned, uh, my, my own background uh, is trained as a philosopher and ethicist. Um, so you know, my, my experience so far with ChatGPT, I've played with it a few times and you know, kind of tried to poke and prod and see, <laughs> see, see where some of the gaps are. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Brilliant. Well, pleasure to have you here. Uh, Alex, do you want to say a few words about what your kind of current focus is and your experience with ChatGPT? Yeah, at the moment, hello everyone, I'm Alex. So at the moment, my focus in my day-to-day -day job is to growing up the team, managing people. So a very challenging role, I'll say. And uh, implementing few new technologies in our day-to-day -day workflow including automation and AI to some extent. Um, my experience with ChatGPT, well, very positive, I'll say. I'm kind of optimistic um, for how to use it. And what I'm trying to do is just experimenting with ChatGPT. So I'm trying to figure out new experiments almost every day and try to execute them and share the results with the, with the audience, with the people, basically. Brilliant. Well, it sounds like we've got the right panelists then. Um, for transparency, 
my experience with ChatGPT, um, I use it now and then uh, when I'm developing code, um, usually to help me uh, generate ideas or think for a problem. Uh, I'll use it as a kind of tool to prompt me into uh, different areas. Uh, and I personally think it can be a really useful tool if you come at it from an informed perspective. Um, but taking its outputs at face values can be dangerous, and you can end up with um, some insidious side effects that you may not notice unless you're careful. Um, but enough about the three of us for a second. Uh, we want to also get your thoughts. Um, so we have a Slido poll here, and we'd be really interested to, to know whether you've used ChatGPT uh, already, uh, just yes or no, or if, if you've tried to, to get on and not been able to, to access it, uh, which I know has happened to me quite frequently. Um, so yeah, do, do scan the, the QR code or, or log on at slido.com uh, with the number just there. We'll, uh, we'll give it a few uh, moments just so that you can cast your votes. So it's looking like... Of course, yeah, yeah. Feel, feel free if you, if you've, if, if you, if you can't uh, contribute as well. Uh, on the Slido, then we can also do a show of hands. It'd be interesting to see whether they reflect the same result, actually. <laughs> so, so who here has, has used ChatGPT? Raise your hands. OK, so actually, the Slido poll is saying 71%, but in the room, it's more 50-50, I would say. Is that fair to say? Yeah, OK. Um, so there's at least a, a, a good number of you that have used it. And obviously, we're here not just to discuss whether we used it, but whether we think it's going to be the next big thing, whether the hype is justified, or whether it's going to be a passing trend. So we'd also like to know what you think of that. Um, so feel free to, to answer that question on the Slido again. Uh, I'll give it a little minute. And then we can also do a show of hands as well. Oh, it's a bit more, bit more divided. Slightly positive. <laughs> well, that's that's a very good point, and I think you know, as as we may find out tonight, that uh, it may be a little bit bit more nuanced than a uh, than a yes or no. Okay, uh, so let's also do a show of hands while while we're here as well. So, if you think it is the next big thing, the hype is justified. Raise your hand. Okay, so that that is about. 50-50, maybe 55-60. So probably more reflective of the slider in, in that case. OK, um, so now we know where we all stand. Uh, we can get into it proper. Um, so before we get into the nitty gritty, Alex and, and Gina, um, Given there's a mix of backgrounds in the room, I thought it'd be useful for, for just, just to go over the basics of what ChatGPT is and, and how it works. Um, so in short, it's a chatbot, right? So it's a software application that engages in human-like behavior, uh, conversation that is, with, uh, with, with a user. And that can be via written text in the case of ChatGPT uh, or sometimes spoken word. Uh, ChatGPT was launched in November last year, 2022, uh, by OpenAI, which is a San Francisco-based research laboratory and company. Uh, it's currently free and available to the public, uh, but OpenAI have also released a subscription service as well. And by virtue of the fact that we're all uh, here to talk about it, it's obvious, but it's proved immensely popular um, with the public. Um, it accrued over a million users in its first week uh, following its launch. In the, in the following months, it accrued over 100 million users. Some predictions have it reaching a billion users by the end of the year. Um, it's garnered sustained attention from the global media. And it's provoked excitement and warnings of caution in equal measures from the tech world. So. Chat, chatbots have been around since the 1960s, though. So, what's what's the big fuss? And I think I'll I'll let uh, Alex and Gina uh, have a stab at answering that question. So, um, Gina, in in your opinion, 
what's the big fuss about? Why is everyone talking about ChatGPT? Why are we here? Uh, I think that's a really excellent question, honestly, um, because as you were pointing out, it's it's not on a, it's not really like a great leap of difference between ChatGPT and other, you know, large language models, chatbots that have come before. Um, I think maybe the two things that I would point to are the specific way that they have kind of designed it to engage in in a sort of dialogue, right? So ChatGPT being specifically set up to have dialogue in that way. Um, and then that, it, frankly, just that they kind of made a, a user interface and sort of threw open the doors, which is not quite how it's gone before. Um, so, so some of the some of the virality of it, I will confess, I don't fully understand. But I think it's some combination of those two things. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alex, why, why do you think it's uh, kicked off so much interest? Yeah. I I think it comes from the fact that uh, basically you have a very simple interface, very simple, which is accessible for all the users. So that simple interface is the first thing. And then, yeah, it's been like chatbots been around. I, I remember trying to play with uh, Watson, IBM Watson. Mm -hmm. So it's so hard to get something out from this. And then, it's, you know, you type something and you have something immediately. So easy to use, simple interface, and probably a little bit of magic, I think. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good point because I, I think I think my thought on it is 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 just that exactly. So the reason it's so popular is because it's easy to use, and the reason it's easy to use is because it actually has a pretty good uh, stab at uh, sounding like a human. Like it's it's actually doing what. We've hoped large language models, which we'll get onto in, in a minute, um, uh, we'd, what we'd hoped they'd do um, for, for many years, and we're kind of starting to reach that point now where it's eerily like a human, and, and that is really engaging for, for users and, and makes it easy to converse with because there's no uh, kind of learning barrier at all in, in that sense. Um, I guess we should also touch a, a little bit, I don't want to get too into super technical details, but just how ChatGPT works in general. Um, so the power behind ChatGPT is OpenAI's uh, GPT-3, which is a, a family of language models on which it's built. And in a very basic sense, language models use probability distributions to guess which word or, or words, sequences of words, should appear at a given point uh, in a a sentence or a, a text. And in modern language modeling, um, these distributions are learned by neural networks um, uh, via exposure to e example text or speech, so tra training data, essentially. And I think the reason why chat GPT stands out particularly is because of its size, the size of its training data set. Um, it's very, very large, hundreds of gigabytes, and includes uh, essentially all of Wikipedia, large fractions of the internet, many books, um, and this, this, its size allows it to uh, authoritatively respond to things that it's not specifically trained on, which makes it very versatile, I think. And so, I, for me, that personally, that's what uh, is driving this kind of interest. So on that versatility, um, it would be good to have uh, a little chat about what both of you think are uh, kind of useful uh, applications of ChatGPT, what the, what the pros of it are, things you're excited about. Um, so Alex, let's start with you. Um, what are you excited about, uh, about ChatGPT? What have you been using it for? Yeah. Uh for me, the, the most exciting thing is that uh, you can very easily, with one click, generate new ideas. And then, because there is no kind of uh, justification of idea, idea can be true or not true, it's just an idea. So it's a concept. It's very easy to get new ideas. That's probably the best thing. W whatever you think, whatever domain you touch, there's always be you always have some idea coming out. So that's, that's the first thing. And then 
the other just talking from marketing perspective because marketing is working with a large set of texts, whatever it's like a blog post, social media, ads, et cetera, et cetera. You can use chat GPT to generate ideas and also basically apply them directly into your like a marketing strategies. So yeah, I think that's, that's the most exciting thing. Gina, do you have any thoughts on kind of positive use cases for ChatGPT? Uh, from what I can tell, it seems to share the same kind of qualities that as other computer programs do, which is like helping you to do certain things more quickly and efficiently. Yeah. Uh, I would add a lot of asterisks <laughs> <laughs> qualifications to that statement, but uh, for example, people have told me that they find it super useful for providing structured to unstructured data or you know they could input a whole bunch of text and say in a marketing context like pick uh, choose some tags right for this text that I should use uh, for my blog post or something along those lines and then it you know will split out very quickly so you know time saving essentially yeah. in that respect and so would, would you agree Alex in terms of um, productivity that kind of yeah. thing so on, on the subject of productivity, I, I personally think that's probably, what, uh, in my own experience, one of the um, uh, plus sides of, of the technology. For an informed user, it can really speed up what you want to do. And that, that really, in, from my own experience and from anecdotal experience, uh, it doesn't really matter about the field. Um, but for coding, for example, it can, it can, it can what you would spend a day uh, Googling and researching and trying to work out what to do. ChatGPT can give you a few prompts in the space of a couple of minutes, and then you're off to the races with uh, your development. Um, so I think there's definitely a huge capacity there for it to produce, for, um, improve your productivity. But you, so on that note, so some people have said it's, it's the next industrial revolution. It's going to um, change, change the way we work in a positive way. Would you agree with that? I think I can start to guess your answers. But Gina, what, uh, <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, I think that we will see adoption, especially you know, by various companies. But my... My best guess is that the limitations are going to assert themselves very quickly. Okay. So I'm curious, like, how, I mean, I think someone said, can I answer yes to both, <laughs> right? Like, so I'm curious how much it will be, like, the next big thing, and then, oh, it didn't quite pan out, you okay. know, the way that we thought. So you think... It's a positive thing, but maybe it's, it's a bit overhyped in that, in that sense. Well, I don't know if it's a positive thing, but I do think... Okay people believe it's a positive thing and okay. that they are willing to incorporate it on that basis. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, well, we'll get on to the, ne the negatives, um, but just let's just stay on the, on the positives for, for a second. So, Alex, uh, is, it, is it the next uh, industrial revolution, do you think? I'm not sure it's a revolution, but it's more like I'll describe it as a storm bringer because it just brings more awareness in AI in general to the wider public. So AI has always been, oh, this is something very techy, you know, and people are thinking, oh, that's not for me. But now everyone can use AI on a day-to-day basis. And that's one thing. And then open AI, open uh, API uh, a week ago, I think. Mm -hmm. So now we'll see probably in the next six, nine months, there will be a huge amount of new application based on chat GPT as a backend. And uh, it's, for me, it looks like uh, dot com ages, you know, okay. like something similar. I, I just feel it that way. Yeah. Uh, so that will start bringing more and more, um, you know, applications of AI, not only chat GPT, just chat GPT was the, the, you know, the pioneer somehow to the wider public. And, and so you've mentioned lots of positive use cases, but would you say that it's kind of systematically changed the way you work or the way people work in, in marketing? Uh, in marketing, it's, it's, very, it's very early stages, I would say, at the moment. I think what I can share with you, I've done one like a survey and uh, let's say 400-ish people and I asked, do you have ChatGPT open as a tab on your browser? 
and 80% say, yeah, I have ChatGPT open as, as a tab on my browser all day long. Okay. So, and also people, I ask them, are you use ChatGPT in the weekend? They say, yeah, we use it in the weekend. What they're doing in the weekend, like planning trips, things like that. But, you know, just for two, two, three months, you can see how there's a change in users' behavior. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm interested in the audience, actually. So that, that kind of point about whether you use it for work or for, or for personal things. Mm -hmm. So how, how many of you use it for, for work, say, more than once a week? Say? OK, so a fair number of you. And what about like personal things, just like fun or like, I don't know, making a meal plan or exercise or something? OK, so not, not that many then. Um, so mostly work-based then. OK. Um, OK, so we've talked about the positives. Uh, as with any kind of uh, disruptive technology, um, which is what I would call ChatGPT, I think, um, there are, there are many positive use cases, but inevitably they come with uh, a, a mirror image, a flip side or, or a downside. And it would be good to uh, kind of start to pull apart, pull out some, some themes as to, as to what that might be for, for ChatGPT. So if you just follow the media and you've been following uh, news coverage about ChatGPT, you probably will have seen uh, a, a really mixed bag in terms of the tone of articles. So some are very, very positive, kind of it's going to be revolutionary, it's going to change the workplace. And then you kind of have this backlash, which is it's going to uh, destroy people's jobs, it's going to um, collapse the economy, uh, you know, and, and anything in between. So, Gina, why do you think people are worried about ChatGPT? Uh, several reasons. So... Because of the size of the data and the nature of the data that it's trained on as a model, right? It's taken from basically a huge scrape of the internet. And the internet is not a representative sample of you know, all the kinds of knowledge that you might want. It has a lot of different sort of biases to it. Um, so ChatGPT has ingested and incorporated all of those biases. So, I mean, I think that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is because it's probabilistic, it doesn't, it doesn't understand truth, logic, causality, you know, like all, it just knows what's probable, right? right. In terms of its output. And so anything for which having major factual errors is a problem, can potentially crop up when you're using ChatGPT. So, you know, something like the potential for bias, the potential for falsehoods, and all presented in an extremely authoritative manner, I think just opens the door for a lot of problems. Yeah, I think uh, that kind of authoritative, authoritative sense that it delivers its re responses in, regardless of, of, uh, of the topic, can be really in insidious. So you know, you, you could write, you could, a company could ask ChatGPT to write, uh, draw up a, an employment contract for its em employees, right? Uh, but it would be really uh, dangerous to just like hand that out and use it without right. a, a legal expert, you know, uh, looking over it. For right, example, right, exactly. Um, and, you know, vice versa. Uh, similarly, with asking it to design an aeroplane or something, you know, you'd want an, uh, an engineer to look at that before you start building the aeroplane. Um, but what about you, Alex? Um, I know you have quite a, 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 a kind of a positive sense. You've been using it in a really positive way. Are there any, are there any things that you've picked up in your field that, where people are worried about it? Um, I know copywriting might be like a, mm -hmm. uh, an area of uh, trouble there. Yeah. So uh, what I saw till now, it's in terms of uh, people are worried basically about their jobs. That's the thing. So and that's obviously you know, valuable thing, but, um, you know, changing the jobs and wiping out some jobs that's happening in past, that's going to happen in future, so that's not something, you know, we need to adapt somehow. Um, so that's one of the things. The other thing is, like, um, from my perspective, is that some people just accept everything as truth, but that's, that's not true. Chat GPT is basically a good actor. He's good in making up something and if you want to use it in 
in business, you really need to check the facts or just don't use it to, to facts. If you use it for ideas, fine. Ideas are ideas. There's no, they're good or bad ideas. Doesn't matter. Ideas are fantasies. But uh, if you want to do a contract, as you said, or if you want to create something, you always need to check first, is it true or not? And second, if, for example, you're writing a blog post, is that something that I would like to say or not? If it's not something you would like to say, don't publish it, edit it until it's something you would like to say. Yeah. So this comes back to the, 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 the training set as well. I think so there's that issue there with kind of accountability and uh, getting at where, where the information is coming from. Um, so what can be done about that? So what, what, what can we do to stop people taking things at face value? Or where, where does the responsibility lie in that? Is, it, is the responsibility with the user? Or should OpenAI, in this case, be doing something to, um, to fact check or to, or to um, uh, you know, um, prompt users into being a bit more careful with the output? So what are your thoughts on that, Gina? Yeah, um, so I, I was at an event uh, earlier this week with William Isaac, who is a senior researcher at DeepMind. Um, and works on large language models just like this, not ChatGPT in particular, but you know they have their own thing. It just hasn't been released. Um, and one of the points that he made that I thought was really astute is that OpenAI has not really clarified whether ChatGPT is a research demonstration or a consumer product. And because of that kind of like haziness, it it means that if people are adopting it like a consumer product, then OpenAI has effectively you know, uh, put, put all of the risk onto the users, right? They, they didn't stop and think in advance, how might this affect teachers who are trying to assign students to write essays, right. which are going to be bad essays. Yeah. But the point is, that's how you learn to write a good essay, is writing bad ones, right? Yeah. So, it, it's just externalizing all of the risk. And, and I think that the point that William Isaac made of that ambiguity of like, what is this? What is this thing? Is, is what part of what makes it so difficult. Yeah, yeah. And the, the point about plagiarism is, is, is really interesting, right? Because it, it, on, on the one hand, you can, you can treat it just like a tool. Like uh, you can use the internet, right? To, to, to help you write an essay. But it's about how you treat that how you treat your sources and how you adopt that tool and, and, and how you own up to how you've used that tool, I think. And so it's, it's a really interesting point. And um, Alex, how, how does that work in, in the world of, like, uh, of marketing and copywriting? Do you have similar issues in, uh, with plagiarism? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably go into some different direction. It's, I think like uh, in terms of responsibilities, yeah. the, the leadership of the business it's responsible because if you don't have a policy at your company, the employees are going to use it in very different way and you basically don't know what's going on. Yeah. But you need to have a like a straight policy and also to train people how to use it, to show them the good stuff, the bad stuff, to show them like a good case scenarios, bad case scenarios so they can figure out exactly how to use it, but also have a policy and constantly training, training people if you want to use it in the, in the business case. So, so you're an advocate of kind of using it in a, an informed sense, but what, what, so you're, some universities have banned it, for example. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, um, do you think that's justified? I think I believe in natural selection, so we'll see what's <laughs> going to happen, but I think <laughs> I think in general, the universities, that's my opinion, needs to rethink the way they work. Because if we, if we encourage people to think more, to use critical thinking, to use creativity, that's, we have like a better, gen, better next generation rather than trying to be a policeman. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so Gina, what are your thoughts on that? And also to, to add, that point Alex just raised about kind of critical thinking. Uh, do you think ChatGPT is going to help or hinder 
uh, you know, the, the future students and their, their critical thinking capabilities? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, so if you think about the relationship between students and teachers and what they're all ostensibly doing in a classroom, in principle, students are there to learn and teachers are there to facilitate that learning. And one of the ways that for a very long time, teachers have thought is a good method for encouraging learning, for example, is assigning certain kinds of essays. But students, not all students are in a classroom because they you know, are, are wanting to have that perfect learning experience. Maybe they just want to get their degree and get the heck out of there. Right. Or maybe they would love to learn, but they're absolutely swamped and they just don't have time, right? So there are these other pressures and interests that are gonna make using a tool like ChatGPT rather than independently doing the work really appealing. And so it's sort of like teachers are aware, right, of those pressures. And so now with this thing kind of released onto the world, yeah. I don't think any longer you can just go on as you've been before and not expect that it's going to be used. Yeah. So I think that's where like the big question is about universities are saying, oh, we're banning this outright versus others who are embracing it. Like, it's really not clear what's ultimately going to happen. But I think a bit of the tragedy there is that the people who made this tool sort of release it on society and now all of education has to adjust, <laughs> right? So yeah. I think that's, that's kind of calling up what we were talking about earlier about like, where's the accountability on this? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I should point out also that, 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 that teachers are using ChatGPT as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a two-way street, I think, in, in that respect. Um, your point about kind of uh, like, what we were just talking about reminded me of, I think I've heard people talk about the advent of the calculator, right? And it, I think at the time it came out, people said that it was going to make everyone enumerate and uh, no one would be able to do maths anymore. Uh, but in reality, it's kind of you know, a very useful tool and uh, I use calculator probably every day, more than I'd care to admit in front of an audience of 80 people. Uh, but it doesn't stop me being able to do maths, I think. And so I think there is a balance that you can strike, well, we'll have to strike, really, uh, because like you said, it's, it's out there, it's people are using it, and it's affecting industries already. And the, I think the best case scenario that we can uh, work towards is finding some equilibrium where it's being used as a tool in, and uh, people are acknowledging that it exists and not just trying to, to suppress it. Still, inevitably having to adjust their learning and uh, teaching styles even to, to account for that. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting point that you raise about the kind of, it just being released. And I wondered uh, on that point, um, what you think the fact, the balance between the fact that private companies have to, don't have to, but private companies are developing these things, right? And they cost a lot of money to develop and therefore they probably want to make some money back from that, right? So they're coming from this private sphere. And I wondered what your opinions were on uh, developing these technologies which could be really helpful and then also having to, to pay for them in a way and to, to monetize them. Whether you think that's inevitable, whether there's a different approach or whether the current approach is just how it is, and we're going to get these technologies foisted on us from uh, you know, private companies forevermore, or whether there is a different way of doing things. So, Alex, what do you think about that? So, yeah, as, as a private company, obviously, they're, they're chasing a profit somehow. So, uh, it's released, and I think I heard this somewhere, and I really like it, that actually the users are the products. When you have a free, free product which has such a demand that the actual product are the users. It's, that's why today we are here, because we are the product, yep. basically. But yeah, um, I think they're, they're going to chase for profit anyways. And 
So we should come back to that point about uh, the users being the, the kind of commodity, because that's similar for search engines, and I'd like to touch on that as mm -hmm. well. But, but Gina, what, what do you think about the, the way that the, this, these technologies are produced, um, and whether it's OK to just leave, leave it to, to private companies? Right, well, I think one of the most difficult things about the current technological ecosystem that we live in is that the power is dominated um, so strongly by a small handful of technology companies, private technology companies. Um, because as you know, we've all seen just even with something like social media, kind of the, the consequences of being beholden to, to entities that we don't have any way to really like hold accountable or that have any kind of you know, uh, uh, democratic, you know, <laughs> uh, aspect to them. It's just like our un our unelected tech overlords, and I, and I think that it, this is sort of just like an intensification of that same dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I mean, it, it's been in the news recently uh, a fair bit about. Um, Governments dis at least discussing bringing in direct legislation to regulate these, uh, well, reg regulate AI in general. Um, I know there's a lot of noise at the moment about that happening in the US. Um, there's nothing specific in the UK at, at the moment, as far as I know, but there are kind of piece wise coverage for, for that kind of regulation. Um, but what do you think about kind of direct? Um, regulation in, in that sense is it is it necessary is it uh, would it hamper uh, the development of these kind of technologies do you think I, would it hamper the development of the technology I think almost that kind of comes back to that point about is this a research demonstration or a consumer product yeah. right because it you can do all kinds of things in research even when there's regulation if you look at like the pharmaceutical industry they're conducting research and finding new kinds of drugs and potential treatments all the time. Yeah. But if you then want to take any of those research outputs and turn it into a consumer product, there's extremely rigorous standards that you have to meet to protect the health and safety of the public. Yeah. And right now, that's the piece that we're missing. So I think that AI regulation is incredibly important um, because AI already touches many areas of life where people can experience extreme harms. Yeah. So, and Alex, do you, th do you think uh, the way that people use ChatGPT would change if it was if it was regulated in in that way? Well, I don't think it's going to change. You don't think even, it's going to change? even if it's regulated, there's you know, people probably are continue to use it as it is. Is there is like a straight regulation and you need to follow these rules yeah probably there will be some change of some people's behavior for sure yeah but i also think there should be some sort of regulations anyway okay and so i wanted to come back to your point about um users being the the kind of commodity the the, the product and this is that kind of criticism has been angled at google for example uh, quite a lot and chat gpt in the media is often uttered in the same breath as, as Google, as in it's honestly really freaked Google out. And they've gone code red, <laughs> yeah. uh, as they put it. And they're worried about it um, perhaps replacing Google search. And so, and you, you may have also seen in the news that um, Microsoft are in, have integrated um, a, a, a chat GPT into its Bing search engine. Um, so. I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, whether that's a good idea or not. So, Alex, what, what, what? Uh, to use a chatbot in place of a search engine? Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. So, um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, I think you you can't replace search with a chatbot uh, simply because. If you do search and you want to have an options, you want to have more than one options. And with the chatbot, you have just one option. So it's not kind of proper research. Let's say you want to buy new trainers. And if the algorithm is fitted with right. all of your history and you know what's the best trainer for you, what's your choice? Yeah. So 
it can we can replace search engine but i think google they're freaking out just simply because their market share is going down and then now bing is kind of getting some chunk of the market share and they're like a new generation people have a different approach even i don't know if you're aware but like a young generation they basically don't use Google to search, they use TikTok to search right, right, for right, products. Right, yeah. So there is not just Chappity, there is another players over there. So uh, Google need to come with something different or something better. Or, you know, if you want to think like more globally, like we're, we're so, you no, know, oh, Google, it's going to last forever. But why we think that Google is a company, 25 years old company. So. I mean, from a global perspective, that's a blink of an eye. Yeah. So Google may disappear and be replaced with something else. But anyways, yeah, there'll be kind of a big change in search marketing. And probably one of the things which is very important for, for business and for small business is that uh, the small business really rely on search to get traffic to their websites. So imagine you have one result and then all the small businesses on page two or page three on page seven, they don't get any traffic. Yeah. So that, that creates a different disruption in the economy. Yeah. So that's probably a more kind of threatening and challenging rather than do we have one answer or do we have multiple answers? So because there's too, too many things connected to the search engines today. Yeah. And Gina, any thoughts? Is it, is it gonna kill, yeah. kill the search engine? Uh, I really agree with Alex's point. I, I, I think there's an important distinction between the way that something like ChatGPT Chat works because it becomes um, a one-to-many instead of a many-to-many -many kind of dynamic. So in, in something like a Google search, lots of people are using it to search and it will provide you pages and pages of potential results and then you can kind of search through them and that's even true if you're like searching tiktok because you're a member of gen z right then there's a lot of different tiktoks <laughs> that you can look at and kind of you know make your choice right on what you're searching for but with something like an ai chatbot it's going to give you one answer most of the time i mean unless you specifically say give me 10 options you know yeah. like it's going to just give you that one reply yeah. so it becomes a single source of truth and i think that dynamic also is what will motivate a, a big power struggle honestly right because yeah. everyone wants to be the single source of truth so, you know so microsoft being wanted and i'm sure google does and other players who have not yet kind of entered the game but it, it makes things very high stakes and i think so, so i think i think personally there's always going to be a place for that kind of the search engine as it exists now um you know if you look at what people the the, the top searches in in google they're they're breaking news, their local information that needs to be up to date. And GPT, right, is in, is in the name, it's, it's pre-trained. So I don't think it's, in, at the moment, it's gonna be able to compete with, uh, with that in that sense, but it could definitely take away a, a share of that uh, being the single source of truth with Google, it kind of basically is now, you know, it, it's, a, it's a verb so to Google something. Um, so it, it's gonna be really interesting in the future how it does disrupt that space. So I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I, I would like to hear from the audience as well. So I think I think we also need to, to, to get to, to, to the, the big question, which is: is it is it the next big thing? We've kind of touched on this, or is it going to is the hype going to die down? And by that I mean what what's next? So where's this technology going? Um, where do you see large language models, um, the future iterations of ChatGPT? Um, going and how how is it going to affect uh, society, the way we work, that kind of thing. So what, what are your thoughts on the future of ChatGPT and large language models, Gina? Uh, well, maybe picking up on the conversation we've just been having, uh, I think it seems like it's really going to place a new premium on human curation, if you will. Right. Um, so you've got, you know, sticking with kind of the topic of internet search, You've got something like um, Stack Overflow that helps people find answers to coding questions that have basically said no ChatGPT, right? Because their value is in those human curated answers. So they don't want that 
yeah. polluted, right, with with AI generated answers. So I, so regardless of what happens, and obviously like we're already seeing adoption, and I wouldn't be surprised if that continues. I think it's going to really, you know, put a big emphasis on did a computer make or suggest this, or was it people, right? Yeah. yeah. And what, what are your thoughts, Alex? Where where do you see the technology going? Yeah, I, I think, um, as I said, there will be like a, a massive increase in new application that basically rely on this technology as a backend. Um, you know, now, now there's API, there's access to an API, and uh, it's just a matter of time people start producing. Even already, they start producing. I can see even big companies uh, introducing some sort of chat GPT um, implementation in their products, like a uh, HubSpot done this, um, what was the other one? Um, Snapchat done this, you know, Facebook doing something like that. So yeah. it's kind of hype, but also I think like people expecting that to, to have it already in every single product. So I think, as I said earlier, it just, it was just a storm bringer, yeah. the, the chat GPT, and that now, now the doors are open, the gates are open, so there will be a lot new innovation, not even based on um, big language models, different things as well. And do either of you think that it's going to be a kind of like you, you, ubiquitous uptake, every single industry is going to be using it, or do you think it will be more kind of here and there, certain industries will pick it up more because it's more suited to their their uh, workflows, that kind of thing. Do you know any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, so far it seems very general purpose. It, and just from what I understand, people are trying it in all kinds of different areas. So yeah. I think it kind of goes back to those intrinsic limitations that I was speaking about earlier. Yeah. You know, like maybe there are certain ways that you could use it, for example, like in, in a legal context but it's not a lawyer, it doesn't understand right. the law, so there's really a lot of constraints on how yeah. that could be deployed in that context. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered, like, it's very sensitive, it can be very sensitive to, to what you write into the prompt, and, and it will be interesting to see in the future whether, you know, prompt writing becomes a, a skill, mm -hmm. you know, uh, r rather than, uh, than working on whatever the output is itself and you kind of get really good at, at writing certain prompts to, to, to get the information out that you need. So I think it could, it could end up changing what are deemed as, as skills in the future um, in kind of unforeseen ways, potentially. Um, okay, well, it would also be interesting to hear from, from the audience. Um, are there any questions for Gina and Alex or anyone in the, in the, in the panel? Question here. I think we've got a roaming mic. Oh, oh, sorry, we'll come come back to you. Oh. So, just to pick up on the, the very last point you made, um, is there anything inherently within the product that means that it can never act like a lawyer? Is it is it that it, if you trained it on the right things, could it offer legal advice? Because it does know, it does understand the law in whatever understand means, or is it something fundamental in the in large man, large language models that means that there are some things it can't do? Uh, and more generically, what are the limitations of the large language models? So, so I'll, I'll say a couple of sentences, and then I'll pass, pass over to, to Gina and Alex if you have anything to add. My take on that would be. And you touched on it there. It's whether it, it knows it, what it's talking about, what it's un, whether it understands. And I, I personally don't think it does. It's just trained to produce the most probable response to that question or that prompt. And it doesn't understand it in that fundamental sense. Like uh, uh, I was reading Gina's article uh, today, and there was a great section in it, which is you ask it what two plus two is, and it says four, but that's because what that's what most often comes after two plus two, right? It doesn't understand what two is and what four is. So I think in that sense, it, it would be, I don't know if it's impossible, but it would be very difficult to trust it with things that are 
in-depth, complex like that. It will produce a very convincing answer, but it's, in my opinion, it would still need to be checked. Um, but isn't that the way that the law works? That the law works on precedent. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you both think, uh, Gina? What do you think? Yeah. I, I mean, I would echo your comments. Um, it 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 doesn't seem like something that can learn can, can update its priors in a certain way. Uh, I saw an example transcript earlier that that was asking it, okay, ChatGPT, um, please tell me 10 famous philosophers. And it lists all right. Western male philosophers. Yeah. And then the person says, okay, great, thank you. But you didn't include any women. Could you include some women, please? And it's like, sure, here's 10 women philosophers. They're all Western, right? And so then the person who's writing the input said, okay, those Though, thank you for adding women, but those are all Western philosophers. Can you list some others? And so it's, yes, here's 10 non-Western philosophers. They're all men. <laughs> okay. Can you list something? Yes. Okay. So finally, we get to a list of non-Western women philosophers. Next question. ChatGPT, give me 10 philosophers. And it's the same as the first list. So it right? So it doesn't, it doesn't learn, right? No. And I think in law, that's very important. It's the interpretation of past precedent as well. So, Alex, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think if you train model with, uh, with the proper data and probably do some changes in the model itself, right. probably it can start learning from the, from the chat. Probably that's not chat GPT, that's something different. But I see, like even with all the profession that you, you, you basically uh, deal with facts, whatever that means, it can have some implication. At least, um, you know, as I can imagine in my fantasies, it's kind of, there'll be like a, you, every, every single professional, we have a, a personal chatbot assistant. So if you're uh, a lawyer, you can have a chatbot assistant that basically do the, uh, the scrape work for you. And then you can just check, see, okay, if that makes sense, no, yes, no, and then take it from there. You don't need to read a thousands of pages to get to the bottom of something. So I think it comes back to that point that we discussed earlier about it, it, it really enabling experts to become much more efficient, but you still will need that expert um, input or expert oversight, I think. Um, any other questions from the audience? So, Stephen, I'll let you decide. I think maybe on the, on the right there was... All right, thanks of all. Thank you for the presentation. It was really nice. Uh, so building on that current discussion, you mentioned that the chat GPT is using probability to, to produce the answers, uh, whereas I think what it stands, uh, what it puts apart from other language models is that there's a lot of human annotation that goes into the process. Yeah. And effectively, what they're doing right now is creating more of these human interactions, which they will later feed again to the model. Yeah. So I guess my question is, do you think in theory, is it possible with, with enough of these human interactions to create a more human-like chat? Uh, I think so. I think that's, like you said, it, I think that is part of what helps ChatGPT stand apart. It's so conversational, it's so believable. And that probably is from that kind of, uh, humans kind of adopting both sides of the conversation and demonstrating it. So if you do more of that, I guess it would become more believable. Um, I still think it might have a limit, but um, what do you think, Alex? What do you think? Um, yeah, I think Chat GPT four is coming up, so that will be more data. Uh, yeah. GPT four, I mean the model. Yeah. Uh, so there, there will be more data, and uh, it, it's expect to be more accurate than it is at the moment. And do you think it could become more human by uh, virtue of the same process that? Uh, we I'm, I'm not about. sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Any thoughts? Probably it can. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious why we would want it to be more human-like, <laughs> right? Like, uh, in some places, um, oh, uh, my my brain's out of juice. But I th I think there's somewhere where they've basically made it a regulation, like a, a it's a requirement that 
you can't interact with a machine and not know it's a machine, right? Like right. if you think it's human on the other end. There's kind of dishonesty. Right, there. but yeah, because there's a dishonesty there. So, yeah. I mean, maybe you could make it even more human-like than it already is, which I think arguably is like, yeah. that's part of what's compelling about it. But, but, but why? <laughs> I think it's a really good point. The, interest and question, the, interest the interesting question here is, do you think we can start building or creating relationship with the chatbot? That's, that's interesting for me because if right. we can, then we have a problem. <laughs> well, there have been some um, trials where they've replaced uh, or uh, therapists have been assisted with chat GPT responses. Yeah, but I mean, real human and relationship. Uh, right. Like imagine implication in uh, dating sites or things like that. Well, there's um, there's a kind of AI companion called Replica that this is already happening oh, yeah. Replica, with. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I should take this opportunity to pitch another event. <laughs> <laughs> the Center for Techno Moral Futures is having a, an event on April 24th in the evening that's going to be on the topic of technologically mediated intimacy. So like ways that these kind of tools you know, are kind of making their way into some of our, our, our most intimate relationships. Yeah. You know, so come. Um, it'll be streamed online also if you want to join online. Okay. And so I, I think you, you've touched, so we'll, we'll probably have time for one more question, but just to, to add a final thought. We didn't really touch on this in the discussion, but like a, a big thing around, I think, why uh, chatbots are, can be um, dangerous is because humans look for meaning behind things, right? And behind, we assume it sounds like a human, it feels like a human, there must be some like uh, agency behind it, but actually there's not, at least not in the current iteration. Um, and I think therein lies some of the, the issue and the kind of what, what leads to these problems that we were discussing with around ethics, all of this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, um, we have another question. One, time for one more. Oh. Sorry. I was just wondering if there's a problem about um, <coughs> how these models deal with novelty. So when new knowledge comes along, it is not the consensus it's not what everybody thinks but if the model is fitted to the most probable solution the most frequent solution does that not mean we just have a regression to the mean the regression to what everybody thinks and new ideas get lost isn't there a problem with this i, I would agree yeah <laughs> um what, what, what do you think alex i never thought about that but yeah that's very valid yeah totally, totally agree <laughs> yeah I think there's, yeah, there, there is a real issue there. I mean, it's not, the, it's not the model's fault, it's doing what it's, it's designed to do, right? It's, it's how humans interpret it and how you, humans use it and regard it, like how we see it in our, our own mind. And the issues arise from where we misinterpret what it is and, and what it's doing, I think. Except Alex was saying earlier that he was using, he uses it mostly as a way of generating new ideas. Yeah. So if you've got a regression to a mean, that's kind of the opposite. Yeah, you can use it to generate ideas, but you can do ideas by your own, because it just just creates probability to to have a good sounding sentence. But that can be a total nonsense, or can be something brilliant as well. So it's it's this thing that it, 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 Chat GPT, to my mind, is it's a little bit like cold reading. It seems meaningful because it sounds meaningful but there's no inspiration, there's no kind of substance behind it. Maybe that's more of a philosophical question that, I, that I'm struggling with anyway on it. The point there, which wasn't on, on the mic, was that, that, that no, no, it's okay. It's, uh, so the, the counterpoint was that, um, you know, Alex was using it to generate new ideas, but um, I think there's a difference there in the question. It's how does it handle new information rather than can it help me generate new ideas based on the sum of the internet and human knowledge kind of thing. So I think they are, they are subtly, subtly different things. Um, there, won't, there won't be a new idea in chat GPT. There will be an idea seen somewhere else in the internet, but it won't be new would it? because the, the model is based on the internet. Yeah, so, so the point... The point there was that it will, it will only encounter new information if it's fed that, essentially. Is, is, that, what, is that what you're saying there? No, coming back to Alex, like if, if you ask ChatGP to give you new ideas, there will be ideas that they've been already seen somewhere else. 
otherwise chat gpt in my understanding wouldn't be able to mm. infer ideas it, would it, it? It can generate new things. It's, it's generative in that sense. It's not, not literally regurgitating text wholesale. Um, but it, in, in the same way that if you, you randomly think of something, right? It's, like, it's that, random, that random part that means it is generative. It can come up with new things that didn't exist before. Um, but it, I think it's a subtle difference there between uh, how it handles a new idea. Um, I think that's what. For example, so if you know the, the concept called uh, for generating ideas called inside the box, so there's a concept of how you can generate idea that you get something, whatever, it's for products and remove something and that's a new product or add something and that's new product. So ChatGPT can do that because it has the information about the product. So if you go into that, that route, that's completely new thing, not existing, but it's based on something already existing. I mean, probably it, it, it can come with a new philosophical concept that never been heard till now. Probably that's not possible, but most of the thing, most of innovations in our life, it's based on something that it's been there before. So it's, it's still a new idea. And so did you want to add to that question? Well, we will come to you as well. But, so, so go ahead. <laughs> so, so here, and then, and then, final question. Uh, this this gentleman over here. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think sort of along that line, it, you know, because it, if you can, when you to generate a new idea, it's effectively the prompt that 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 triggers the idea being generated, and effectively, you giving it a prompt, ChatGPT could put things together that potentially no one would have thought of because it it is on a probabilistic sense, putting stuff together from anywhere in its training set. So the idea could be completely novel. But then who owns that idea? Because you wrote the prompt and you gave it to ChatGPT and ChatGPT came up with it. So who owns it? Because yeah, OpenAI might want to patent it. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question. I, I had some, some discussion like that in more in arts because you can imagine what's going on there in, in the art space. So. If you, and it's the same concept, if you, if you do a prompt and, and get a picture, who owns the, who, who is the copyright owner? The, the platform, the prompter, or the, um, what is, there's one more option. So yeah, I don't know, there's no, there's, there's no, there's no regulation on that. And I think that will, there will be a new kind of chats on, on that topic and there will be some sort of regulation on who owns it. But yeah, yeah, nobody knows at the moment. Yeah. It's not an entity that mm -hmm. um, Final question from the very patient person there. At the <laughs> it's, it's kind of a question, but also just a bit of a comment. Sure. Uh, I, I get slightly up, upset's the wrong word. It's too simplistic for me to say it's like when we introduce calculators in the school. Sure. Because what this is like is a calculator that tells you two plus two is five. Two plus two is five. Two plus two is five. And after a while, we start to accept that two plus two is five because right. chat GPT says it is. Right, right. And that's the issue I find with this tool is that because we've become used to the authoritativeness of now Wikipedia, when it never used to be authoritative and you used to be told never use it sure. for any kind of information. Yeah. And that was, a, that was a claim against it that has now been effectively kind of fixed or even being able to search Google and then you get to see where the references are. Because we, as humans, have adapted to that world, we are transferring that understanding of what putting a question into a, into a web interface does and accepting that what we're getting back from GPT has the same, chat GPT has the same level of trustworthiness and authority that we are, get, that we are used to. So I actually brought up at the, at the event on Monday there was an inkling of a kind of question or a statement that the issue is not actually the technology or the way the technology is being presented to us, which is what I think is the hype bit. It's actually us. And, and part of what ChatGPT is doing really well is playing on our human susceptibility. The fact that we will ascribe humanity to a dog allows us to ascribe humanity to a web interface, and then we start thinking, you know, 
as Turing kind of said, if we think it's human, yeah. it kind of is because we, have, we are seeing it as human. And that's the issue. And for us to all, for the world to be a beta test for open AI is where I start thinking this is actually immoral because there are no guardrails and, and we're all being used to test this and we will adapt to it, not the other way around because that's what we do with every technology. We are the most adaptable species, so we will adapt to the technology and, and it's out there. The genie's out of the bottle. So more of a comment than a question, but... <laughs> very, very good point. I think the question needs to be asked. And I think, it, for me, it's a passing trend, but the implications of what comes next from ChatGPT, whether we stop doing large language models and do constrained language models that only look at the law. Yeah. yeah. And then when you constrain it and you know what the sources are that have gone into the model, you can start to give it some confidence. But at the moment, where well, we just don't know where it's getting the information from and we have no sources and if you ask it to give it the sources it won't and it will generate i.e. make things up and even when you tell it that's not true it will repeat that yeah. untruth because it doesn't know what that really means so my question if it's any kind of question is if this if this is a future for technology where is the next logical step for this, considering that it has a whole lot of issues today? How do, how do we handle that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what a great comment. Yeah, um, it, it feels like humans, and your point about, we, we always, we, we, we're like, we want it to be kind of sentient. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, and how do, how do you think that kind of, I, I guess we didn't really touch on this, but how, how our humanity intersects with the need for ethics. It, it, ultimately, you mentioned the training data set. Mm -hmm. That has come from humans, right? Mm -hmm. So everything that's on the internet was put there by humans. So can we be doing anything to, as a, a community to, to stop that or to, to, to help that in the future for f future iterations? Or should it purely be the responsibility of whoever's training that? Uh, that technology. Mm, what do you mean? Can we can we help? Well, is there a responsibility on us to uh, think about the discourse that we're putting out, and also how we're? Uh, and, and you mean I, as the source of the training data? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure. I, I would certainly endorse everyone act, acting much more ethically on the internet. You know? <laughs> That seems like very wishful thinking, <laughs> um, but but yeah, I, I would like to see a lot more accountability by the companies that create and deploy yeah. the models and applications of the models. Um, I think you'll probably see a lot of finger pointing happening there, like something will happen. Is it the fault of the company who made the application or the fault of the company that made the model that the application uses, right? So. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, I don't know, storms, a lot of storms yeah. to come. Okay, well, on that note, I think we're, well, we're sticking around afterwards. So if you have more questions, we'll probably hopefully be around for, for a little bit and we can continue conversation. Uh, Paul, I think we have some, some further information to, to finish off the evening, right? I just wanted to start by saying, uh, can we give them a huge round of applause? I hope you all found that as interesting as I did.